Russ is a multimedia producer who runs the creative team T-Stop Pictures. He specializes in documentary style production and tackles everything from commercials for ad agencies and Fortune 100 companies to branded content creation for universities and nonprofits. Partially because he married into the opera scene, he has worked with several small companies and individual performers in the Boston area. Where I go, what I do, ain't for him and ain't for you. It's the spirit that's working in my soul. It's I want to kick off the conversation by getting your point of view on self-filming versus professional filming. Um, I think there's a complex answer, um, but I think the short answer is that self-filming is a-okay um, for performers, and I think certainly younger performers coming straight out of conservatory may not have a lot of marketing budget. Uh, you know, as a young performer, you are your own small business, your, your own marketing department, or your own agent in most cases. You are uh, your own web designer. So anywhere you can save uh, on costs of any sort with creative, with marketing, I think you're looking for the opportunity to do so. And I think video is definitely um, an area where you may not need to spring for high production value right off the bat. Um, certainly as you become more established, as you have more of your own sort of resources to um, do that sort of thing, there is some value there. But, you know, iPhones are pretty solid these days if you uh, set one up on a, a tripod and, um, you know, film yourself or have somebody monitor it while you sing. I think that most companies are going to be okay with that for most purposes. Um, if it's... Uh, a case of springing for either audio production, pro audio production and mixing versus pro video. And I would go for the pro audio every time just because it's classical music and it's so precise and what the companies are looking for is to hear the, you know, the nuances of the singing and get a general sense of, you know, what you look like, who you are as a performer. But um, I, I do believe even though I'm probably not pushing anybody toward my own services with this view that um, that you can get away with a lot with self-filming as an opera singer. Great. I think that's really nice to hear from a videographer that that's okay. <laughs> um, do you have recommendations for singers on camera placement and lighting that just some quick tips? I think the first thing to think about is your audience. And, you know, are you making this for general distribution on your website? Are you making it for a specific competition or a specific audition? Often in those cases, the companies may have relatively firm guidelines on how to record. You know, do they want, are they open to vertical video? Do they, um, do they want it to be one continuous take uh, as opposed to um, two camera production, which you're probably not doing with your phone anyway, but you, you know, you could get two phones, you can come together and I know it's possible. Um, so I, I think that's the first thing to think about is um, are there guidelines or requirements that you're expected to meet for a certain video? If you're doing it for your own purposes, for your website, um, I think the first thing to think about is, again, audio. How are you recording that sound? Are you hiring um, you know, a pro audio recordist, pro audio mixer to get that high quality sound? and you're just setting up your iPhone, you're gonna get that video and you're gonna sync it up with the sound afterward um, with the mixed, you know, full pro sound. If you're capturing your own, um, you know, I'm sure Ken could speak to this too or, or any of the audio pros you're talking to, but um, I think a lot of singers do pretty well with like a, you know, a Zoom recorder or some sort of handheld digital audio recorder with a relatively solid reputation. You can get some pretty good sound from those. Um, most uh, video small teams or video pros like myself aren't, you know, don't specialize in classical audio recording. It is a bit of a specialty. And so having somebody who knows that, like a Ken Silver, is really valuable, um, even if you're recording your own video. 
But if you're, uh, if you're doing your own video, your own audio, uh, once you have those lined up, I think lighting is an important thing to think about. I would rather have a video that's recorded on an iPhone with good lighting than something that's shot on a pro camera with poor lighting. So um, you may be able to get away with practicals. You may be able, uh, practicals being, um, you know, just lights you would have around your, your home or um, something like that. Uh, you may be able to get away with natural light if you have the right space. I think a lot of singers may have access to a church where they sing or something like that, that they can you know, get talk somebody into letting them use. And those sometimes have nice natural light. Um, there are relatively affordable LED panels you can get on Amazon. Um, you know, do a little research, see what's well reviewed. A lot of people do, you know, home webcasting or web production now, and you can get away with pretty cheap gear if you're not looking to, you know, make something really cinematic and you just want to be visible. And um, so I think doing a little research on that, uh, there, there are a ton of tutorials out there. If you just, you know, um, search how to light an interview, how to light for performance, something like that. Um, I think a lot of singers would be able to set up something that is going to make that video quality a lot better than if they're shooting with a window at their back with an iPhone, you end up with a bleedy silhouette. So um, framing wise, it's a bit of personal preference and I, I can't really speak to what companies are looking for. I think there's a good bit of subjectivity there. Um, some people, if they only have one angle are gonna want that wide shot. So you can see the singer, the piano, um, I always recommend, regardless of the framing, not to stare directly into the camera, um, which is a thing from film production. You know, if you've ever seen the, um, the Uncle Sam, you know, I want you poster that looks right at you, the eyes follow you wherever you're going, it's a little unsettling. And I think just something performers can relate to from not looking right at audience members as they're singing. So same thing with the camera. Find an eye line that's just up and over or just off. Uh, camera and whoever's filming it, if you have somebody helping you film, can advise on that as well, can keep an eye on it. Um, and that's true whether it's a wide shot, it's less important for wide shots. Certainly, the closer you get, the more obvious it's going to be that you're looking right into the camera. Uh, medium framing seems to work pretty well, and I think some singers like that because it shows off a little more of their. Um, acting a little more technique. I think close up is only something you're going to do if you have multiple cameras. And so, if we're filming with a, with a singer, we're usually going to do a two camera approach where one's a wide shot, you got the singer and the piano, and the other is um, pushing out an in between, like a medium, which is sort of torso up, and a close up, which is more shoulders and face. And that gives you a nice variety of looks. Obviously, the close ups for singers that want to accent they're acting um, is helpful for companies to see the minutia of the performance. My next question is, if you are one of those performers that decides they want to hire a professional, what should you ask for? What kind of cameras, how many cameras? You mentioned it a little bit. A lot of the same points, I think, from the last question uh, apply here. And one being that this is what I've advised singer friends if they really only want a wide shot, you know, if a company's only asking for a wide shot, it probably doesn't make sense to hire a company, uh, a professional production person or team or company to, to do your video. You can just stick a, you know, an iPhone in the back of the house and, and get that wide shot and have something passable that they can see what's going on. It's relatively crisp and ultimately they're focused on the music. Um, if you're producing something for your own website, I think, um, having two cameras would be the way to go. Uh, it allows you to have the wide and the option of the close up or the medium or some other angles that really allow you to have a more intimate sense of the performance and make sure they're going to bring lighting. Um, you know, really ask what, if, if you're expecting the video team to do sound, I would really ask them if they have experience doing classical audio. Um, because it is a specialty, I would always recommend getting a dedicated audio person who has experience working with classical music, classical singers and musicians, um, and then pairing them with the video pros. 
it's a very simple process on our end. We just record a scratch audio track and then sync it with the master mix track after the, um, the audio engineer completes it. So um, those are two things to ask. Obviously, budget. Um, if you have a strict budget limit, make that clear. Just say, hey, what, what can you do for me on this limit? It may be too low budget for them, um, but they may know somebody who's a younger just starting out and wants to try to shoot some of these things to get some experience. And ultimately, I think with all of these creative services, marketing services that you're trying to do for yourself as a young performer, trying to get favors from friends is always a good way to go. You know, if you know somebody who knows somebody who's trying to get started as a video person, see if they'll do it for, you know, a, a low amount or, you know, a, a barter or something like that. Um, I think that's true with any of these creative services, web design too. Um, you know, young performers, like any young creatives, are often strapped for cash. And so you got to find ways to get some results that look, you know, good, that are useful for marketing, but aren't going to break the bank. So, but one advantage of the two cameras is a lot of companies want to see a continuous take. Um, but if you have two camera coverage, it gives you a lot more room to hide a cut point in the audio uh, and use, say, this half, this verse, this half, you know, splice together a couple different takes um, while still looking like a continuous take. Um, if you're doing multiple takes with two cameras, it gives you that freedom. Great. I think that's wonderful advice and takes off, I'm sure, a lot of pressure off of the singer. Would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's very useful. And I know, I mean, I know that I would have loved to hear all of this because everyone's always pushing for you to spend money. And I think it's very kind of nice and exceptional that there's a human out there that doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's diminishing returns um, when you're investing in video production for personal operatic purposes. Um, you know, I, at the other end of the spectrum, I don't know, th this is rarer, but there are cases where it's just kind of over the top. It looks like a, like an 80s music video <laughs> and you've got like, you know, camera, you know, camera movement and candles and um, it's very atmospheric and you're just like, that's too much. You know, I'm distracted from the music and I'm pretty sure this person is bankrolled by rich parents or something and like do I really want to work with this person anyway yeah um, so I think there is a good middle ground where it may be worth investing if you have them you know if you have the resources yeah. for that two camera simple two camera pro production nothing uh, nothing lavish um, but obviously iPhone is workable for younger yeah. performers following up on that what is a typical budget if you are going to hire a professional, I realize that probably ranges, but just to get an idea. Yeah, no, that's what we all want to know. And I think it's so highly variable, um, as you know, acknowledge. And that variability is not just based on sort of production value or the experience of the team. I think it always, it also varies a lot from city to city. So I don't know, this is probably not a Boston specific thing, um, you know, rates and Boston can vary from rates in New York, can vary from rates in Phoenix. Um, you know, smaller cities or sort of smaller production scenes, you might actually be able to find people with better gear and skills able to do things more cheaply. So it's hard for me to set a, an industry standard for this sort of production because it's not really a big industry. Um, but I think if you're looking for like a young person just out of school and you want to pitch them like, hey, what can you do for me for 200 bucks? You might be able to get a handful of arias out of that. Um, I think for, you know, we, in my team, we extend nonprofit, our nonprofit rates, our lowest nonprofit rates to singers and certainly do sort of buddy rates for, for friends as well. And so you end up looking kind of in a similar range with um, headshots, I think, where it's sort of the 500 to 1,000 range, and you're looking to get four plus arias out of that. Um, and we, you know, I try to be as flexible as possible working with singers and, you know, really 
squeezing as many arias into a shoot as possible, which could be taxing on a singer, of course, but that limits our production days, which is how we bill. Certainly, if you're looking to hire pros, find out how they bill. Are they billing daily? Are they billing hourly? Are they willing to just say 500's the cap if we need to film four days? Great. It's going to be hard to find, but you know there may be young folks who are willing to do that. Um, obviously, from a scheduling planning standpoint, there's an, another big consideration there, and that is certainly in cities like Boston, New York, space is at a premium. And so you're paying for that space, you're paying for your pianist. And so you really do want to try to get everything in one session, if possible. Um, you know, you don't want to be like, hey, let's film one aria Monday, another one Wednesday, another one Friday. That's going to be wildly inefficient for um, budget. So after talking, Russ gave me approximate video production ranges for performers and small companies. Assume these cover controlled environment recordings of approximately four complete arias shot and edited or videography of a full performance, recital, or concert. These estimates are for video only and do not include rates for a dedicated classical audio recordist or engineer. For less than $500, you can get self-filming with a phone, camcorder, consumer DSLR, or something similar. You can potentially hire a film student or newbie pro looking to build experience, or you have a really good buddy rate by pro video acquaintances, but you can probably assume you'll get a single camera. For the range of $500 to $1,500, you get a low budget pro or a pro buddy rates for individual or potentially for small companies. You get one to two camera coverage plus editing, tiling, basic correction, and effects. For the budget range of $1,500 to $3,000, you get higher production value pro coverage for individuals or small companies, two to three cameras or more, um, with premium lighting and lensing options plus editing, tiling, color correction, and effects. For everything above 3 k you get various levels of pro-production and post-production, most likely irrelevant to early career individual performers or small companies due to the prohibitive costs and diminishing returns. For an hourly rate of about 20 to 100, you get video post-production, editing mainly, hourlies, day rates, or per video cost, typically depending on experience and expertise, but for performer reels or performance excerpts, you may be able to create something perfectly functional with a less experienced editor at a discount rate. There is also the $0 self-edit option, of course. So obviously these are just a guideline and you would have to talk with whoever you would hire. Um, thank you. So I kind of want to talk about reels now. Um, so say you worked with a company and they have footage. Is there a best way to ask them for it so that you can then use the material yourself? Reels are an important topic, I think, because the stuff you film yourself or the stuff you even hire pros to film a handful of arias with you that are, you throw a lot of money into it. It's big budget. It looks really nice. It's still, um, the difference between, you know, in, in feature films or acting, you have a screen test and then you have clips and scenes from actual movies you've been in. And I think that's the difference for companies to be able to see you perform on a stage in a show with all the pressure that comes with a live audience is, I would imagine, um, more valuable in many ways than being able to see you perform in a controlled environment where you have multiple takes and can make something beautiful. but um, but it's not really that sort of game footage, if you will. So I think it's really important to check with companies, you know, when you're signing the contract or when you are um, agreeing to appear in a show, ask them. It may not be, you know, a lot of small companies may not even write this into the language, but um, check the language of the contract. If there isn't any about multimedia, ask them what their policies are and see if they're going to be filming the show. Um, and especially your cast, sometimes double cast shows only have one cast filmed. And ask them in advance what the you know policy or the process is for gaining rights to that footage. Most small companies are happy to have their material distributed. I've never run into one that told a performer they couldn't use the footage. Um, it's usually just a matter of pressing them because a lot of small medium companies don't even follow up 
like we'll I, I can't count the number of shows we've filmed for small companies that never get distributed as far as I can tell in any form whatsoever it used to be they would sell DVDs to the cast um, you know as if you're not paying them little enough already uh, but now I think a lot of that digital footage just sort of is archival and, and companies have it, but they don't often distribute it. And I, I think it's a missed opportunity for a lot of performers to have some, you know, pieces they performed in professional or, you know, a real performance context um, that they can distribute. So at the outset, finding out what the policy is, finding out how you're going to secure that footage if you need to pay a licensing fee or anything like that. I've never had companies um, charge that, but it's an option. Uh, it might be a nominal fee, just like when you buy a DVD, or you used to do that before everything was all digital and web-based. But um, then really following up after the fact, because it can be months down the line. You know, we often offer buddy rates, low rates for small companies, and so the trade-off is that there's no rush on delivery. It might be months later that we're getting that that polished show to the company, and by that point, you know, performers may have forgotten that it was filmed. So that's how to get the footage. And then a reel um, for those, I mean, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I think a lot of people know what a reel is, but it's a collection of short clips from performances you've been in. And if you have, um, you know, something where you've filmed with a couple of cameras, you've hired pros to do a controlled environment sort of shoot for recording, you can absolutely cut that in with live performance footage um, to show a little more of your, um, you know, maybe it's a, a piece you just learned and you haven't had a chance to perform it. Maybe, you know, as with so many pieces, you just haven't had a chance to perform it because it's hard to get roles. But um, I think there's no reason you can't do that as long as I would, I would be a little more wary about cutting in, uh, you know, your, your iPhone footage with that one. But it doesn't have to be a lot of roles. Um, it can be one show and you have one aria and one duet, that's a good basis for a reel. Um, and if you don't like the reel approach, having it all in one video in one place, I think a lot of singers have a portfolio page where they've got clips and that's useful in its own right because you can include the entire aria um, as opposed to a reel, you're usually pulling like a minute. Um, a minute from this clip, a minute from this scene here where you're delivering a, a short monologue or something like that. Um, whereas on your portfolio, you can say, here's me performing this entire piece. Here's me performing this entire duet in a concert setting. Um, so I, the more you ask, well, not demand, but you know, ask companies and make sure you're getting all the multimedia they're producing of you um, from shows and, and making sure you have the right to distribute it for your own portfolio, website, real user for competition submissions, um, the better. You know, it, it doesn't hurt. You might, a lot of singers will watch it back and be like, oh, that's really good, but I missed, you know, one note, so I'm not going to use that video. <laughs> but it helps to have it anyway and, uh, and know that you can use it or you can use portions of it for, for a reel. Well, I guess that's the real advantage of a reel is that if you did miss that one note, you can just boop, cut it. <laughs> that's something where you're also saving because you're not paying to get a, have it produced um, unless you're paying a license fee from the company. And so what you are paying for is somebody to edit the reel. And that's typically a lot more, it's a lot easier to find somebody who can affordably edit the reel with some level ex of e expertise versus hiring a team that has pro cameras and you know it's a lot harder to find really discount options on that front I think but um, also a lot of performers are creatively inclined themselves and I think you can definitely build your own reel and iMovie or whatever consumer you know editing program editing software you have access to. Great thank you so much. Um, I want to ask you the, the same question that I ask everybody I interview. Do you have any advice for the young singers of today? Any advice for the young singers of today? Well, um, you know, obviously my knowledge of the scene is a bit secondhand, uh, just having married into it and, and observing Catherine as she's 
you know, built up Opera on Tap and, and been in so many shows and, you know, seeing all of our singer friends and their shows and hearing about the experiences they've gone through. So um, it's not from personal experience on the scene. Um, I think it would return to my opening note that as a young performer, you are your own ad agency. And the more you can sort of learn at, a, at, a, at least a, you know, surface level, some of the skills um, needed to market yourself in today's environment, web design. I've seen performers build beautiful websites by themselves. Um, I've seen performers cut really excellent videos by themselves. And I think most performers have the ability to at least put out a pretty, you know, pretty pro looking project without necessarily springing for pro production across the board. So the more you can, you know, you're already used to being your own, your own advocate, going out for shows, um, networking in the scene and collaborating with colleagues to produce all sorts of music. So um, I think the more you can do that on the marketing and design and production side as well, the more successful, well, I can't say that. It's, it's such a crapshoot in the industry, isn't it? But <laughs> the, better, the better you're setting yourself up to be seen and, and heard and appreciated as a pro, so. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, I really appreciate all the time you took to answer my questions today. Thanks for, um, thanks for having the idea and uh, thanks for having me on to talk and I'm happy to answer more questions if there are any follow-ups down the line. For those of you who are listening and thought to yourselves, well, you know, I'm at this stage in my career where I really would like a professional video with a professional videographer and you're in the Boston area, I highly, highly recommend Russ. Uh, you can check out his work on his Vimeo, vimeo.com backslash tstoppicks or his website, www.tstoppicks.com. I'm Theodora, and we've been in the wings with Russ Anderson. Join us next time as we talk with Ken Silver about audio engineering. If you liked this video, please subscribe to my page. And if you have questions that you would like me to ask in the future, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you can join us next time.